Uh, this is epic, yells my three-year-old son Ben last weekend as he lets his legs go on a steep rocky trail with his arms spread and his head up, looking at the canopy of one of the last East Coast littoral rainforests in a small pocket of, gr of green at the end of my home street in Lighthouse Beach, Port Macquarie, otherwise known as Birupai Country. It was always going to end in tears, an epic fail, three-year-old style, nothing that a dust-off and a hug can't fix. But in that 15-second emotional high and low of the experiential roller coaster of a young man's life on a local walking trail last weekend lies a reaffirmation of that great truth. And that is if you really want to live, and I mean really live, with all the epicness that truly living requires, then we need to wise up to the Greek tragedy bedfellow that Epic shares, a pillow partner called failure. It is why the seatbelt was made. Failure is expected when an Epic tool like speed is given to us. Like a hand in a glove, failure wraps its ever-present self around anything Epic. It is the strangler fig of our own human rainforest, forever present in the bird shit of human activity. <laughs> the most colourful tree with the juiciest fruit attracts the birds who turn this epic beauty into the seeds of a brown, distorted, stinking mash of death. It is the zero-sum game of both epic and fail. My three-year-old son chooses to use the word epic as a reflection of his new generation. Let's call them Generation ABC. And it is shaped around a popular kids movie of the same name. So what was once cool or wizard or funky or deadly or massive or unreal or awesome or happening or even it is now epic. For the non-keepers of a Generation ABC in your homes, the movie Epic is best summarised as a kid's version of Avatar. And if you haven't seen Avatar, it's best summarised exactly in 25 words as forest creatures fighting forest-destroying monster. Humans get involved and stuff it up. Happy ending when all decide to get on and play nicely. <laughs> it's the Lorax meets the great, great Graham Bases, you know's garden, and any number of books and movies about the theme of environment versus economy. So. My epic failure is not what I see in the collective thought bubble above all your heads. That question you're all asking yourselves about how is this bloke going to talk for 10 minutes about a 17-minute speech? No, for me, that was neither epic nor a failure, even if I banged on for probably four, maybe five minutes too long. Nor was it an epic fail to do what I said I was going to do when I stood successfully at two federal elections and stayed true to my mandate of getting an emissions trading scheme and the national broadband network rolling in Australia. The Fairfax... Yep, thanks. <laughs> my puff puff moment. <laughs> the Fairfax press defined me on day one post the 2010 election as a rural progressive who wants an ETS in the NBN. They even had a breakout box describing how my house was used for refugee Australians as part of the Rural Australians for Refugees. That the News Limited media and others then chose to turn all this into some act of disloyalty and betrayal is their problem, not mine, and therefore not any reflective epic fail on my behalf at all. No, my epic fails are many, but not there. Rather, they are in the big policy areas of biodiversity loss and carbon pricing. They are in my inability to recognise and then to handle the very big shift happening in Australian politics right now, a shift to what I call corporate conflict theory, and then the consequences of this, where I and we have failed epically to put a check on the privatisation of democracy in Australia today. For Firstly, the epic policy failure of climate change. In 2010, my somewhat think simple thinking was fairly brutal. I knew Peter Costello had tried and failed in 2001 to get an ETS through Cabinet. 
a new former Prime Minister's Howard and Rudd had both taken the advice of scientists and econo economists seriously. And famously, I knew the bipartisan deal was nearly done in 2009 between Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull. My view at the time was the science nor economics were in serious question by political leadership and that the LNP had merely cobbled together uh, something called direct action to get them through an election without killing each other internally. So my view was to help ram an ETS through, clean up the edges along the way, and then let the scientists and economists, as well as logic, evidence and common sense, win the politics. How wrong I was. <laughs> I lived the birth of the false tax debate. I watched it grow, I watched it win. I watched an ETS go as a consequence, an epic fail all round. It wasn't just about climate. I saw two very uh, similar types of fail happening at once to make it happen. One, the frustrating, all-encompassing, inward-looking labour, and combined with that was a fucking Abbott interrogation lesson. <laughs> two different types of fail, but both combined to stop all policy boats from politically floating, but particularly an emissions trading scheme. And now the frustration for people like me is we're stuck in a political contest on what should only be one tool in the toolbox, on the suite of measures that need to happen in the multi-trillion dollar ecosystem service and landscape management space. It is my view that biodiversity loss is Australia's greatest environmental challenge by a country mile. But trying to initiate anything new in this regard how has politicians running a country mile as they are locked in this carbon tax showdown. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but if I drop back into 2010 and had this opportunity again, I would make biodiversity loss the top of the pyramid of what we were trying to address, instead of making the science of a gas the top of the pyramid. By doing so, community engagement on the science of a koala would be easier than on a colourless, odourless gas. And more importantly, the broader suite of tools required would have been easier, making the chances of much needed bipartisanship more certain. Now, the deeper question on this is the one of advice. When every single MP is getting exactly the same strong and urgent advice, the unanswered question is how on earth can we all have allowed this epic fail on carbon policy to happen? The answer for me, money, political donations and the extreme influence of the business union in Australia today. And this is where my other two epic fails combine. I lost in politics to money. I poked power in the eye and got an almighty punch in the nose. Sociology textbooks don't talk about conflict theory being used by the powerful to create dissent and division and uncertainty in a community. It's supposed to be the tool of the marginalised and the disadvantaged, the basis of the union and street protests. But if this is true, why was Australia's richest woman getting off a bus to do street protests? Or Twiggy photographed weekly in his safety clothes to protest? or Packer winding up the pubs and clubs to unsettle the masses, inviting 60 MPs through his Crown Casino, or the late Paul Ramsey, the LNP's biggest donor, handing out pamphlets to patients in regards private health insurance reform, or Rupert on media reform, on NBN, or frankly, just about anything. In that 43rd parliament, I met and personally dealt with six of the 10 richest people in Australia, I did not ring and ask to meet with any single one of them. They are crawling all over your democracy. Democracy was stronger in that period than at any recent time in recent parliaments because no one or nothing owned it. The epic failure was the business union using corporate conflict theory to allow our parliament to be perceived as undemocratic. The business union did it well, they did it successfully, and now we have the select few back in happy command and control. The pussycat called power is purring again. The epic fail of our time is this entrenched privatisation 
of our, our own democracy. So my epicest of epic fails <laughs> is that I'm part of a generation X and Y that is really a generation Z. We will be looked back on by my three-year-old Ben and many others as a failed generation, asleep to the great challenges of real democracy. The first generation to consume and waste more than we can produce and collect. We're the first generation to allow our children a shorter life expectancy than our own. If actions speak louder than words, we do not care about tomorrow. So the sequel to today's kids' movie epic will be the adult version called Fail. They'll watch it in about 30 years' time. It will be a movie about all of us, sloth-like and asleep. Thankfully, it'll frustrate and bore them. Thankfully, the circle of life, the yin and the yang, the whatever you want to call it, will, I believe, inspire a great generation to react to our own failure with epic innovation and entrepreneurship a time of progress based on evidence and logic, not inertia based on shrill adversarial politics. A time of a whole new series of failures we don't even know about. They'll be great and epic because they have to be. They have to be epic because of our own failures today. Epic failures that I carry as a burden more than most. So run, Ben, run. Run down that hill as fast as you can. It is your time. We need you to be epic.